With the long and winding path through history, from ancient times to the Renaissance and beyond, alchemy is a vast subject, with a multitude of practitioners, from the legendary and mythical to established medical gentry and scholarly clergy. In fact, and in fiction, they were men and women obsessed by the magical bending of the laws of nature to their will, creating gold, the elixir of life, stones that shone like the sun or offered immortality. Another sect of the sprawling tradition, however, found its interest in a far stranger creation, that of the homunculus or the little man. Their writings can today be seen as some of the strangest works to exist in the history of scientific advancement and are far more in line with the publications of gothic horror that would eventually follow centuries later. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello, welcome to Dark Histories, Season 5, Episode 2. I hope this finds you very well and you're all healthy. Today's episode is one of those sort of episodes that I like to kind of slip into every now and again and, and, and do like sort of a bit more generalised history rather than like focusing in on a, a particular story, I guess. Um, I, I've done it a few times in the past with like the vampires and the zombies and things like that. But I hadn't done one for a while, so I thought, you know, let, let, let's crack on with something like that, you know, break it up a little bit. What I will say, and, and, and I've said it before, I'm sure, that I don't tend to sort of read out warnings or anything like that before we do episodes. You're listening to a podcast called Dark Histories. I think, you, you know, we're all adults. You and I both know what's coming. But with this one in particular, I will just say this is not one to listen to whilst you're eating your dinner. Um, I think I'll just just leave it at that. So yeah, fair warning. If you're eating your dinner, you might want to turn this off till a bit later, you know, finish what you're eating first. With that said, let's crack on. This is Season 5, Episode 2, The Homunculus, From Science Fact to Gothic Fiction. The long history of alchemy, whilst often focusing on wonders such as the transmutation of gold or the philosopher's stone, is in reality so vast and spans such a large time frame and geographical area that to summarise is borderline impossible, not least due to the flexibility of the term itself. And whether you wish to confine it to the transmutation of various metals, or expand it to the wider art of transformation and all the various pathways that this led down, from visual art to early concepts of biology, it was, at times, accepted as a legitimate study of the natural world, and at others, banished from the mainstream and pushed into the realm of counterculture, an ebb and flow that followed it throughout its long history across seas, continents and cultures. As far back as 5000 BCE, the practice of metallurgy was used both in practical and ritual contexts, with the basic principles of extracting various base metals, such as silver, copper, tin, lead and gold from ore. 1500 years later, the fundamentals of creating alloys, such as melding copper and tin to create bronze, ushered in the Bronze Age throughout the Near East. Just over 2000 years later, Iron taken from meteorites was smelted into priceless artefacts, jewellery and the occasional ceremonial weapon. This smelting of iron was much more difficult than earlier alloys and fundamental to the process was the design of a new kind of furnace able to heat the metals to the required temperatures which, once discovered for use on the early meteorological fragments, was expanded upon to cater to the smelting of native metals initiating the beginning of the Iron Age in the Near East. Around this time, dyes were introduced by the most skilled tradesmen, often with a goal to give ordinary items a golden appearance. Far from being a simple scientific process, the earliest practitioners of metallurgy were often mystics and saw metalworking as an almost magical, oftentimes spiritual ritual, and the process was carried out as such with crossover into astronomy coming widely into play. The ancient Greeks played a large role in this creation of alchemy, with the natural philosophers who theorised upon the four elements of earth, air, fire and water 
along with many other philosophical theories put forth by Plato and Aristotle, especially of note being Aristotle's The Origins of Metals. What followed was a jumble of names of legendary alchemists living in the Egyptian city of Alexandria whose attributions to various texts still ignite debate today. However, here the basic rules of alchemy began to be formed, as nature's rules were hammered out by thinkers, students and teachers such as Democritus, Hermes, Isis and Maria Prophetissima. This era also saw the first ban placed upon the practice of turning metal into gold and silver and the first known recorded use of the word Khmer, which would later travel throughout Europe and become the modern term of alchemy. The ban, unsurprisingly, saw only to run the practice of alchemy underground rather than stamp it out entirely. Some of the earliest texts that one could define as recognisable alchemy were originally written in the 3rd century AD in Greco-Roman Egypt. Scraps of work exist written by an Egyptian-born Greek mystic, Zosimos of Panopolis, one of the earliest and most celebrated alchemists of the age, whose existence and attributions to various writings stand with some evidential basis. His work, which was thought to make up over 25 books, now exists only in fragments, but appear to have focused upon the concept of metallic alchemy with a special highlight on the concept of chrysopoeia, or the process of creating gold. In his writings, he often cited earlier practitioners' works and made use of many tools and pieces of equipment that had been previously invented, which clues us into the fact that, although Zosimos was one of the earliest pioneers of his craft, he certainly wasn't the first. From what is left of his work, one can see that despite the crude and obviously early theories, he worked to theoretical principles and laid some of the groundwork to what would become the basics of chemistry. After the Arab conquest of Egypt, many works that dealt with the principles of alchemy were translated into Arabic and further expanded. Jabir ibn Hayyan, one of the greatest Arabic alchemists of this period, evolved Aristotelian principles and produced his theories of sulfur and mercury. Throughout this period of Arabic dominance in the region, many famous works later translated into Latin were written, including The Book of the Secret of Creation and the Art of Nature, along with The Picatrix, a book which included symbols of each planet in the solar system, how to include them in magical sigils, and how they relate to the different metals. In the mid-12th century, Robert of Chester, an English scholar who lived for a period in Spain, which at the time was divided by a Christian and an Arabic leader, translated the first book on alchemy available to English-speaking readers, the Book of the Composition of Alchemy. This further credits to him the creation of the word alchemy itself. Within 10 years, several further key books on alchemy were translated into English and the practice had spread widely throughout the rest of Europe. As in other places before it, it didn't take long before prohibition and restrictions were placed upon the practice, and by the 13th century it was banned in several countries in Europe on the grounds that it promoted the creation of counterfeit coins, and by the church where it was looked upon as heresy. This pushed alchemy further outside the mainstream in medieval Europe, creating a counterculture with an element of secrecy, of mysticism and of ritual that kept it separate from straight science. At times, it could appear magical, occultist or utterly esoteric in its practice. There were mixtures used as ingredients referred to in vague terms and contraptions only available to those with prior reading of books written by practitioners with invented names. It was, in many ways, an art for those initiated and unashamedly exclusive in its knowledge. Despite all of its ritualism, complicated philosophy, and at times mystical approaches to the natural laws, alchemy was not magic. Its ties to transformation, however, linked it with a form of magic long into the Renaissance period, when the studies of many alchemists shifted from the ultimate goal of creating gold to a wider chemistry-based field. Though this was one path taken, there were, as always, 
people with stranger ideas. In European alchemy, the creation of the Philosopher's Stone was variously connected with the ultimate goals of an alchemist to create wealth and the elixir of life. In every era, however, as alchemy was driven underground, another path quickly became further corrupted from some of the more mainstream goals, twisting the art into a form of alchemical, occultist magic that took the concept of transmutation and ran in a new direction. Surrounded as it was in the realms of the esoteric, it was only a small step for a practitioner to veer quickly into the world of the darkest experiments, where things other than gold were the ultimate successes. Tinctures of materials to turn oneself invisible or to imbibe the ability to walk on water were imagined, as too was the creation of life itself. From the earliest days of alchemy, this sidetracked had stepped in tandem, spawning works that today exist in both factured historical and questionably anecdotal texts. Whilst people like Nicholas Flamel became famous for their work with the Philosopher's Stone, which he was said to have used to help build orphanages throughout France with its generation of wealth, there were others who attempted to make a far darker, though arguably just as famous, creation. One struggle when studying the history of alchemy is who to attribute specific writings to. Whilst many works have known authors, the reality as to whether or not the published name actually matched the writer is something of a debate for many manuscripts. This was most often the case in regards to works supposedly written by some of the most famous alchemists of any era, some of who have built up a legendary status. One example of this was Plato, and an interesting example of work falsely attributed to him is a manuscript known as the Liber Vacai, or the Book of the Cow. Published in Spain in the 12th century, the Liber Vacai is in fact a Latin translation by a French bishop, William of Auvergne, of a much earlier Arabic work named the Kitab al-Nawamis. This was written by the famous alchemist Ibn al-Jazar that dates from the 9th century and is now, aside from a few fragments, all but lost. The Liber Vacai is, essentially, a book of 80 experiments split into two halves, with around 40 minor experiments taking up the first half and 40 major experiments the second. The minor experiments concern themselves with simple, everyday natural magic and alchemy, such as the creation of lamps and the creation of illusions, whilst the second section, with its major experiments, busy themselves with much more complicated concepts. From its earliest origins, the debate on spontaneous generation of life was a major path in alchemy. Preceding many early experiments in creation, there existed the concept that lice could spawn from humans on account of their being too moist, and that the rotting corpses of animals left to putrefy would spawn swarms of living bees, as in the process of begonia. Build a house ten cubits high, with all the sides of equal dimensions, with one door and four windows, one on each side. Put an ox into it, thirty months old, very fat and fleshy. Let a number of young men kill him by beating him violently with clubs so as to mangle both flesh and bones, but taking care not to shed any blood. Let all of the orifices, mouth, eyes, nose, etc., be stopped up with clean and fine linen, impregnated with pitch. Let a quantity of time be strewed under the reclining animal, and then let windows and doors be closed and covered with a thick coating of clay to prevent the access of air or wind. After three weeks have passed, let the house be opened and let light and fresh air get access to it, except from the side from which the wind blows strongest. Eleven days afterwards, you will find the house full of bees, hanging together in clusters, and nothing left of the ox but horns, bones and hair. Whilst it's debated whether or not begonia was ever an actual practice, ritual or otherwise, or just a literary device, the basic misunderstanding of biology that underpinned the theories of birth from putrefaction was fairly widespread, and one can see similar instructions in a multitude of works that riff on the idea. Some of the earliest and most famous passages on the creation of life 
exist in the major experiments in the aforementioned Liber Vacae, which evolved this concept of spontaneous generation to one of creation. The magician must take some of his own sperm when it's still warm and mix it with an equal amount of the stone, which is called the stone of the sun, a stone that shines at night like a lamp. With this mixture of sperm and sunstone, the magician inseminates a cow or a ewe. He then carefully plugs up its vagina with the sunstone and smears its genitals with the blood of the animal that was not chosen for insemination. Then the cow or the ewe must be placed in a dark house in which the sun never shines. Its food must be mixed with the blood of the other animal. While awaiting the moment of birth, the magician prepares a powder made of ground sunstone, sulfur, magnet, and green chusha, stirred with the sap of a white willow. The unformed substance to which the ewe or the cow gives birth must be placed in this powder, whereupon it will instantly grow a human skin. The newborn homunculus must be kept in a large glass or lead vessel for three days until it is very hungry, then it is fed on its decapitated mother's blood for seven days until it has developed into a complete animal. There were three such experiments similar to this on the creation of a rational animal included in the Liber Vacae, and the uses of such a creation were vast depending on how the resulting animal was treated. If one were to cut off the head of the animal and feed the blood to a human, the drinker would turn into a cow or sheep. If the blood were rubbed on a human like an ointment, they would instead turn into an ape. If, on the other hand, one were to nurture the animal rather than decapitate it by keeping it in a dark house and feeding it on blood and milk, it could then be killed, gutted, and the organs rubbed on one's feet to allow them to walk on water. Keeping it alive for more than a year in a bath of milk and rainwater would allow one to ask the animal questions concerning the future or faraway lands, which would be perfectly able to answer. A second experiment that was similar in nature to the first instead used the womb of a monkey and the outcome left the practitioner with an animal that could be dissected and its various parts used for a multitude of purposes. Its eyes could be made into a concoction allowing one to see spirits and demons and a drink made from its tongue which would allow one to speak with them. If one were to mix its brain with the brain of a human corpse and spread it upon a tree it would allow the tree to instantly flourish and blossom. Yet another experiment used the heart of an animal wrapped in the skin of its forehead to make the user invisible. In the fourth experiment, detailed in the Liber Vacae, we can see the most direct link with the begonia mentioned previously, using the corpse of a decapitated calf. This involves locking up the corpse in a dark house with 14 closed windows on the east blocking all its body orifices after having reattached the head, hitting it with a large dog's penis, extracting the flesh from the skinned corpse, grinding this with a certain herb and leaving the mixture in a corner of the house until it will be converted into worms. Every following day, a window must be opened and some powdered dead bees thrown upon the worms in order to convert them into bees. Interestingly, in the Liber Vacae, the idea is expanded upon and it's stated that if one were to reverse the instructions, a cow could equally be generated from a swarm of dead bees. The other recipes are equally bizarre and macabre, including an experiment to create a small cow with the face of a human and the wings and claws of a bird. The worms are first generated from the flesh of a certain fish, which must be ground with an equal amount of human blood and put into the brain of a bull, which is then put into a vessel and buried in the ground for 40 days. The successive stages involve the addition of more animal and human substances, more incubatory vessels and burials, leading to the creation of other hybrid animals. A hairy, viper-like worm with two horns and two enormous eyes, big bee-like worms, and a fish with a human face. The fat of the final animal, the cow, can be used as an ointment to transform permanently the shape of a person into a pig or an ape. It's important to note that despite the abhorrent nature of the magical experiments described, the magic itself was not seen as inherently evil. 
At the time, there was an important distinction between magic that was natural and that which was demonic. Demonic magic of the occult underworld called upon demons and witchcraft, whereas natural magic aligned itself far more with alchemy and relied only upon the natural laws of things and exploiting these hidden laws of nature. This was, apparently, a far more acceptable and justifiable approach to magic for most, especially in the eyes of the church. Interestingly, as time passes, surviving copies of the Liber Vacae move from being kept within collections of medical journals to collections of magic and occult writings instead. Not only did the Liber Vacae exist in a murky grey area between necromancy and natural magic, especially with its summoning of spirits, which, in including, made it tread a very grey line, but it also existed in a murky offshoot of alchemy. Though it may be seen as a far cry from the simple concept of alchemy as a practice to transmute one metal into another, it falls perfectly in line with many of the pathways that branched from the magic of transformation and the harnessing of secret natural powers. There were, in fact, many alchemists that saw the pursuit of gold to be nothing compared to the ultimate alchemical goal of creating artificial life. Aside from magic and alchemy, many of the concepts found in the experiments of the Liber Vacae and other texts that contain similar instructions on the creation of life can be directly linked back to Aristotelian theories on sexual reproduction and the concept of spermism, an early theory which suggested that life is created by the combining of menstrual blood and semen, with the father providing the essential characteristics to the offspring via sperm, whilst the mother provided the material substrate via menstrual blood. One gave form, whilst the other matter. This is in turn mixed with the sunstone, an alchemical ingredient that likely stems from the Aristotelian theory that the sun held the power behind all generation of life on earth. Whilst the ideas in the Liber Vacae might seem absurd to us, for readers at the time, much of the material would have been fairly reasonable, with the creation of a homunculus far more acceptable as a concept by itself than when it was mixed with the crossbreeding of animals that takes place in many of the experiments. This was the practice that was considered far more troubling. The Liber Vacae spent about 200 years disseminating across Europe until the 14th century where a copy appeared to wind up on the shores of England. Throughout its life, it has delighted, terrified and enraged readers, many of whom found its use of magic to create godlike powers in the practitioner to be disturbing at best. However, it was unsurprisingly the manual's instructions to create human life that were deemed the most disagreeable. Several translations omitted the offending experiments, mainly on the religious grounds that crossbreeding between men and animal was stepping over a boundary firmly placed by God. Nevertheless, it is perhaps equally unsurprising that the pursuit in the creation of life was far from over with the Christian rejection that branded the Liber Vacae as monstrous. By the 16th century, alchemy was an established arm of study throughout Europe. Though it was still rejected from university teachings, it was nevertheless an important area of study for academics who busied themselves in the natural sciences. As far as homuncula are concerned, if we follow the experimental pathway of creation through putrefaction, we are eventually led to a book published in 1537 by the Swiss alchemist Paracelsus. Born in 1493, Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, later to be mercifully known as Paracelsus, was a natural philosopher, alchemist and physician. In later life, he would go on to pioneer the use of chemistry in medicine, seed the concept of clinical diagnosis and become a founding father of toxicology. However, his ideas were not always as accepted and many were not always quite so grounded. Along with his contributions to medical advancement, Paracelsus also generated theories that, 
along with his rejection of many established medical concepts, saw him chased out of universities across Europe. A maverick in more ways than one, he taught lectures in German rather than Latin in order for his teachings to be more accessible. He invited practitioners who lacked academic backgrounds to his university in Basel and publicly burned copies of works by revered physicians that he disagreed with. His outspoken detest of the establishment pushed him out of the medical profession, at times forbidding him to practice, and it wasn't until after his death in 1541 that his works were truly studied and widely adopted. Quite outside of his medical career, however, Paracelsus had another history that pushed up against the establishment and gave him a reputation in life that often preceded him. As he advanced his medical knowledge and career, so too had he practised in alchemy, astrology and divination. In 1572, the physician Adam von Bodenstein published a book entitled De Natura Rerum, or The Nature of Things, which he attributed to the writings of Paracelsus. Although this attribution is the manner of some debate, it's likely that at least in part it does contain legitimate writings from the Swiss physician. Within the text, Paracelsus or Pseudo-Paracelsus once more turns to putrefaction as a vehicle for transmutation of one thing to another, turning the discussion towards eggs, which he believed were incubated by chickens in order to provide heat that would rot the mucilaginous phlegm inside. Once the matter inside the egg was sufficiently rotted, it would in turn become the living matter that would then go on to develop into a chick. You could, he proposed, replace the living hen with warm ashes and incubate the egg in the same way. Paracelsus then took this concept one step further and described the creation of a basilisk, a man-made monster which he called a monster above all monsters. In an incredible bout of fantastical misogyny, Paracelsus explains that a basilisk, which is created using menstrual blood, sealed in a glass jar and left to rot inside a pile of horse manure, is the embodiment of the greatest impurity of women and is able to kill by merely glancing at the victim, just like a menstruating woman who also has a hidden poison in her eyes. If one could create a basilisk from the menstrual blood of women, Paracelsus goes on to suggest that it is equally possible to create the male counterpart, a homunculus from semen. It was the first time the word homunculus, or Latin for little man, was actually used in any alchemical text. Not only did Paracelsus coin the term, therefore, but he goes on to explain how one could make such an abomination. We must now by no means forget the generation of homunculi, for there is something to it, although it has been kept in great secrecy and kept hidden up to now, and there was not a little doubt and question among the old philosophers whether it even be possible to nature and art that a man can be born outside the female body and without a natural mother. I give this answer that it is by no means opposed to the spagyric art and to nature, but that it is indeed possible. But how this should happen and proceed, its process is thus, that the sperm of a man be putrefied by itself in a sealed glass jar for 40 days with the highest degree of putrefaction in a horse's womb, or at least so long that it comes to life and moves itself and stirs, which is easily observed. After this time, it will look somewhat like a man, but transparent and without a body. If, after this, it be fed wisely with the arcanum of human blood and be nourished for up to 40 weeks and be kept in the even heat of the horse's womb, a living human child grows therefrom, with all its members like another child, which is born of a woman, but much smaller. This miracle of human life was a secret above all secrets and, if nurtured long enough to grow into adulthood, would grow into creatures such as giants and dwarfs, with enhanced strengths and powers. Once again, we can see similar theories of the importance of the male sperm and the female menstrual blood in reproduction. 
the horse's womb mentioned is not, importantly, referring to an actual womb, but rather a warm pile of horse manure used to provide heat to the glass jar. The use of an artificial womb in this way was not only symbolic, it also provided the function of keeping the material warm. The same can be seen in the earlier experiments and that of Pagonia, where a sealed house is used, providing the same purpose, both functionally and symbolically. Not all of Paracelsus's ideas in alchemy were quite so out there, and he was credited with multiple innovations in natural philosophical thought, including the adding of salt as a basic principal element that all natural things in the universe are built from, along with the already established duo of sulphur and mercury. On the other hand, if this were true, then there was no fundamental difference between organic and inorganic matter, and if that was the case, then transforming life from its foundational elements was no different from transforming metals. It was a subtle but dramatic shift in thinking. As for the veracity of the text, there is debate over who actually authored the work, but even if it was not Paracelsus himself, it still shows that at least some alchemists of the age were creating such theories. Over the next couple of centuries, the lines between truth and fiction would continue to blur as the instructions grew murkier, whilst the outcomes even more fantastic. In the 18th century, matters of the homunculus began to break down considerably, and the line between that which was presented as fact and what was presented as fiction blurred considerably. Moving away from direct instruction on how to create a homunculus, there was instead recounted tales of those that claimed to have witnessed their creation. Perhaps most famous here of these is the experiments carried out by an Austrian nobleman named Count Johann Ferdinand von Kustein, together with an Italian cleric and mystic, Abbe Geloni, in 1775. The account of the affair was reconstructed from a series of diary entries originally authored by von Kustein's butler, James Camera, and was published in an 1872 Masonic handbook named De Sphinx, written by Dr. Emil Bezetsny. In this account, the two alchemists produced no less than ten homunculus, housed in glass bell jars filled with water. Their creation lasted for five weeks and was done by closing up each jar with the bladder of an ox and a magical seal. They were buried under two cartloads of manure and the pile daily sprinkled with a certain liquor prepared with great trouble by the adepts. The pile, after such sprinklings, began to ferment and steam as if heated by a subterranean fire. When the bottles were removed, it was found that the spirits had grown to about a span and a half each. The male homunculi were come into possession of heavy beards and the nails of the fingers had grown. In two of the bottles, there was nothing to be seen save clear water, but when the abbe knocked thrice at the seal upon the mouth, uttering at the same time certain Hebrew words, the water turned a mysterious colour and the spirits showed their faces, very small at first, but growing in size till they attained that of a human countenance. And this countenance was horrible and fiendish. These beings were fed every three days by the Count, with a rose-coloured substance which was kept in a silver box. Once a week, the bottles were emptied and filled again with pure rainwater. The change had to be made rapidly because, while the homunculi were exposed to the air, they closed their eyes and seemed to grow weak and unconscious, as though they were about to die. But with the spirits that were invisible, at certain intervals, blood was poured into the water and it disappeared at once, inexplicably, without colouring or troubling it. By some accident, one of the bottles fell one day and was broken. The homunculus within died after a few painful respirations, in spite of all efforts to save him, and the body was buried in the garden. An attempt to generate another, made by the Count without the assistance of the Abbe, who had left, failed. It produced only a small thing, like a leech, which had little vitality and soon died. It's no small coincidence that the account published in the 18th century was far removed from the earlier alchemists' detailed instructions. Vague in the extreme, there's little in the way of evidence to support any of the account, not least that the existence of the count 
nor the location of his home can be verified. The only evidence suggested by the author lies in the apparent visits by a handful of local dignitaries and nobles who were said to have witnessed the homunculi, though once again, no evidence exists. It was, perhaps, no surprise given the encroaching enlightenment that discussion of homunculi became somewhat more fictional in presentation. It would be another 100 years, however, before the concept would be firmly entrenched as a fictional staple rather than a scientific or alchemical miracle. By the 19th century, alchemy had once again been pushed into the realms of counterculture. Gradual distinctions between chemistry and alchemy had been formed in the mid-18th century that had worked to separate the legitimate teachings of the developing sciences of the Enlightenment and the old practices of alchemy, which were increasingly seen as little more than fraud and nonsense. A little more than a hundred years later, however, alchemy was revived in Victorian times by occultist scientists who found much to study in esoteric history interpreting it widely as spiritual, ritualistic and mystical rather than practical. In the case of the homunculus, many writings became allegorical, riffing on the concepts of spiritual rebirth and regeneration. In fiction, the homunculus itself went through something of a rebirth, inspiring works such as the human patchwork of Frankenstein's monster, and later, as the 20th century dawned, W. Somerset Maugham's novel, The Magician, based on a character heavily influenced by Alistair Crowley, sees a revengeful, bitter magician make a sacrifice from his wife in occult rituals to create homunculi, which he kept in glass jars in his manor house, in a far cry from the graphic descriptions of experiments undertaken by medieval alchemists. The homunculus has turned into a staple of horror movies, anime, manga, video games and popular fiction since the earliest years of the 20th century until today. In many respects, the history of alchemy is a fascinating melding of early scientific investigation and utterly fictitious legend building. On a practical level, an alchemist studied the natural laws and produced many useful solutions for dyeing, painting, simple medicines and metallurgy. At the other end of the scale, they pursued the Philosopher's Stone, unimagined wealth, immortality and the creation of life. Even if we remain within the established canon of the legitimate history of alchemy as a scientific practice, we can see legendary figures created, those who experimented with nature to create both the fantastical and the disturbed and in both respects, their pursuits have endured throughout history as a relentless draw for fiction. Their work has inspired the imagination in both horror and delight for hundreds of years, from the gothic tales of the 1800s to Harry Potter in the present time. The names of the legendary alchemists are constantly reimagined and their legends continuously built upon, as are the practices that they chose to embark upon, whether for noble means or those far less savoury. As to the truth of the homunculus, it seems fairly obvious from a modern scientific standpoint that the creation of such beings was purely fictional and formed from a fundamental misunderstanding of biology. With all the modern understanding of reproduction, chemistry and embryology, it can feel utterly absurd that such experiments were ever given much credence at all. However, the mindset of those in the medieval age who followed the grim steps into experimentation give us a truly interesting insight into a dark and strange world where disturbing magic was practiced as perfect logic in macabre playgrounds of the strangest kind. So there we have it. Like I say, I hope you weren't eating your dinner because uh, there was there was some lines in that, weren't there? Um, and yeah... I guess we'll talk about it for a little bit after these short advert breaks. Thanks for listening to Dark Histories. This podcast is entirely independent and funded by myself and listener support. So in order to do that, I need to run a few ads. Our long-time advertising partner is Audible, and the reason I've stuck with them for so long 
is that they offer a service that I actually use and enjoy myself. And I do think it actually offers value to people like myself who enjoy podcasts. If you're unaware of what Audible is, it's an audiobook subscription service which charges a monthly fee in return for one credit, which you're free to spend on any audiobook you like. The catalogue is huge, multilingual, and covers everything from fiction to series of lectures. They have an iOS, Android and web app, and if you use more than one, they all sync up together so that you can listen on any of your devices without having to skip about. If you ever feel like you want to take a break from the subscription, you can do so and you get to keep all your previously bought books. And when you get into a drought, you can just fire it up again and start gaining credits seamlessly. Some of my favourite books on there to date are The Complete Sherlock Holmes, which is read by Stephen Fry. And they've also got the original Exorcist book and just a huge history back catalogue. And I've really enjoyed all of those, basically. So if this sounds like something you might be interested in, head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories. And that's dark histories, all one word. And you can start a free trial that offers a monthly subscription with one free credit so that you can instantly pick an audiobook of your choice. If at the end of the trial, you feel like it's not really for you, you can just cancel it and it's cost you nothing and you get to keep your free book. So once again, that's audible.com forward slash dark histories or you can find the link in the show notes. So earlier I mentioned listener support, and there are a ton of ways that you can get involved and support Dark Histories. The main way is to become a Patreon patron. If you listen to a lot of podcasts, I'm sure you're familiar by now, but for those not so much, Patreon is a way to make a monthly pledge in return for some small perks. On the Dark Histories Patreon, I set my pledges as low as I can really with options for one, three and five dollars per month. And for that, you gain things like early access episodes without these horrible ads, PDF notes and resources that I make and find during my research for each episode. There's also access to the live stream archives and more. So if you enjoy the show and you think it's worth it to you, hop over to darkhistories.com and you can find all the ways that you can support, including our Patreon, or just check out the links in the show notes. If none of that appeals, then sharing it around with all your friends and family is equally as helpful and just as much appreciated. So if you're here, then thanks so much for not skipping the ads with that 30 second skip button and giving my hard sell a listen. I'll let you get back to the episode. Cheers. Welcome back. So homunculus. What do you make of that, right? I mean, wow. Just wow. First of all, I, I, I have to say this, this episode was immense to research and look into. I Obviously, I, I've heard of alchemy before and I, I'd looked up its history, but, but when you try and like actually get into it to obviously write up like a, a kind of brief history of alchemy like I did for this episode. It's so vast and so sprawling. And, and maybe that seems obvious to you if, if you're like familiar with it. You might be sitting there now just sort of shaking your head and thinking, well, duh. I just could not believe how vast it was. But anyway, it was really fascinating to get into. And the, the whole homunculus thing is just bonkers. I mean, I've read some of the strangest books. I... I Books I just never even... Some of those experiments were just insane. I really loved how you could look back at it and you could see the mistakes they'd made or the misunderstandings they'd made and sort of rift upon them. And, and, and you can see that these kind of real absurd leaps of logic actually weren't so absurd. So, like, the spontaneous generation idea of something rotting and something coming from that rot spontaneously is, is kind of genius in a way. Like you think, wow, you know, the person that saw that originally, you can definitely see that that's where their logic was heading, like that this thing has rotted and turned into another thing instead of obviously as we know it now that something rots and it feeds something else 
that was already there and, and that's, you know, like, like maggots and whatnot, and then that turns into flies. But back then, the, the leap of logic from I've got a cow and I've turned it into a bunch of bees it was just just amazing, really. Um, it was... And, and there, is, there were so many stories like that, you know. Um, I, I read a lot about spontaneous generation and this whole idea... It was all much of a muchness now, you know, like that they were saying, like, you know, if if you bury, like, if if you take this dead animal and you bury it in this way or that way, it, there were always ways that would basically allow it to putrefy. More often than not, they relied on heat, um, and that they would turn into like vicious worms and things like that. And you think, yeah, I can see where you're coming from with that, and and, and that was really fascinating. That it was, you know, a fundamental misunderstanding. But you can see the leap in logic. And then the next leap of logic for the, the, the creation of humans is, is just a little bit out there. I mean, again, you can see the, 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 the fatal misunderstanding of the sperm and the menstrual blood and how the sperm was um, character and the menstrual blood was matter, you know, and, and, and one gave form and the other gave kind of material to, to, to the child. And, and you can see like, okay, that's a fundamental misunderstanding, but fair enough, you know, this, this is a long time ago, right? But it's then that, that, that leap in logic that, well, if that's what it is, then I can create it in a glass jar. We don't need a womb and, you know, we don't need any of this other stuff. We can just use a bit of heat in a glass jar. I suppose you can see it and, it, and it does make sense. But that's kind of what I find interesting is, is the way you can see, you know, the, the misunderstanding and, and how they kind of ran with that. I, f- I find that really, really fascinating. Um, so, I, yeah, I found the whole thing really interesting. Absolutely grotesque, though. Probably one of the funniest things was the, the basilisk that you know was uh would could poison people with its eyes because it's created from menstrual blood i could not believe that when i read that i was just like oh my god it's it's really something isn't it like i say there's not so much more to explain and talk about in this episode i don't think i mean wow i mean i mean there's an awful lot to talk about i guess but there's there's nothing really to kind of get I teeth into in terms of like a mystery or anything so i'm probably gonna leave that here i hope you enjoyed it i hope you weren't eating your dinner like i say i hope it didn't gross you out too much i i found it absolutely fascinating like i say it was gross for sure i mean there's no denying that but i found it equally as fascinating as it was grotesque you know um this kind of just, just these old scientific kind of experiments and the things that they could create out of them, like the, you know, the the walking on water and being able to see spirits and and all the rest of it was it was just really really fascinating. So I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back in a, a couple of weeks with a, another episode. If you'd like to contact me, you absolutely can. Uh, contact at darkhistories.com is the email. If you go on the website darkhistories.com, you'll find all the links to contact me on, including all the social media like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. Um, say or the email address, of course, which obviously emails me directly. There's also all the ways that you can support the podcast on there, and um, a shop as well, so like t-shirts and things like that. If you're interested in that kind of thing. So yeah, thanks very much for listening. See you all in a couple of weeks. Take care and sleep tight.